Hi, everyone. My name is Janik Garayeb, and I'm the Senior Health Education and Engagement Specialist with Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada. And thank you so much for joining us today. Our mission is to reach every Canadian affected by a brain tumor through information, education, support, and research. And this webinar series is really just but one educational and informational program that we offer for those affected by brain tumors as well as healthcare professionals. So please make sure you check out our website at braintumor.ca for regular updates and also make sure you follow us on our socials also. And just wanna let everybody know that we have been working from home mostly um, since the beginning of the pandemic. And even though our office is closed to the public, we are still here for you via email, phone and video chat. And speaking of video chat, tonight at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, myself and our uh, one of our social workers, Todd Gould, is going to be going live for a community call-in. On um, we're gonna, the topic we're going to focus on is social isolation during COVID. So if you're interested in joining that, I will link the uh, registration link in the chat in a few minutes once uh, Dr. Um, Suleiman starts his presentation. But before we get into that, just a few logistics before we do get started. Um, everyone has been muted automatically so that we don't have back background noise during the recording of the webinar. If you are having difficulties, difficulties hearing me, please make sure your sound is up on your computer. The webinar is recorded, will be recorded and uploaded to our website within usually within a week or so. And then if you have a question, please type it in the chat window on the right hand side of the GoToWebinar panel. You'll see a little orange uh, arrow that pops the panel open and closed. You can add your question there and we will take up all questions uh, for Dr. Solomon at the end of his presentation. But before we get started, I just wanna do a few poll questions with you, just to kind of gain an understanding as to who is online with us today. So if you could choose one, whether you're a patient or a survivor, a primary caregiver, a family member or friend, a healthcare professional, or a volunteer for Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada. And I'll give you a moment to vote or to add your answer to that. See the numbers popping up and down. We have quite a few healthcare professionals online with us right now, Dr. Soliman, and lots of patients and survivors and some volunteers. And I'll show the results in a second. Looks like everybody's done there. Okay. So yeah, so we have 31% are patient and survivors, 6% are primary caregivers, 8% are family members or a friend. We have 44% who are healthcare professionals and 11% are Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada volunteers. Thank you, everybody. Second poll question is, how did you hear about us? Did you hear about it through uh, Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada communication on social media, through a family member or a friend, online search, or you were referred by a healthcare professional? And as always, most of you have heard about the webinar through one of our emails or newsletters. Um, so that's great. Our marketing team will be very happy to, to hear that. And one last question. It's in relation to the pandemic. So we just want to do a little check in with everybody. Which one of these statements best describe how you currently feel about the pandemic? You're still worried and stressed or you're trying not to worry about it and take it day by day? Give you a second to answer that. You know, there's so much going on with the pandemic and so much in the news and also so many online videos and meetings. So, uh, so it looks like, it looks like most of you are just trying to take it day by day. So that's great. And just know that we are here for you um, at Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada uh, with lots of support programs and a lot of um, educational programs that are happening. So make sure you do check out our website. And at the end of the presentation, I will highlight some of those programs on our website. And I will also send you some links via the chat. So let's get started with um, introducing Dr. Soliman, who is a staff radiation oncologist at the Sunnybrook Odette Cancer Center in Toronto since 2012. He completed his radiation oncology residency at the University of Toronto and went on to complete a one-year fellowship in CNS and lung SBRT. He has a clinical and academic focus in primary and metastatic central nervous system tumors and has helped develop one of the leading CNS programs in North America. He is the current lead for the Gamma Knife program at Sunnybrook. Dr. Suleiman has a special interest in training the next generation of radiation oncologists and is the Director of Education and Fellowship Lead in the Department of Radiation Oncology at the Sunnybrook Odette Cancer Center. This presentation will review an ongoing will review ongoing clinical trials as they relate to the management of brain metastases 
a current literature on brain metastasis management and treatment modalities. I've had the pleasure to collaborate with Dr. Suleiman on a handful of times over the years, and I'm confident you will enjoy his presentation style. So thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Suleiman, and I will hand it over to you. Uh, thank you, Janique. Thank you uh, for organizing uh, this and, and uh, multiple other uh, webinars and educational series. You've been a, a true champion uh, for, for brain tumor uh, patients, and we are always thankful for, uh, for your hard work and, and, and efforts. Uh, so um, my talk today is um, I have about 50 slides, um, and I, I want to leave about 10 to 15 minutes at the end. So I might kind of go through some of the slides a little bit quicker. Uh, so leave about 10 to 15 minutes for questions at the end. Um, I see that, uh, so it was really nice to see that uh, it's a good mix of uh, healthcare providers and, uh, and non-healthcare providers. Uh, you know, sometimes our non-healthcare providers can, uh, can gain a lot of experience and, and get sort of honorary degrees in, 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 uh, in, 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 in brain tumors. So I'll try to keep the lecture uh, interesting and relevant and at the, at the level for, for, for both healthcare, healthcare providers and, and non. But uh, I apologize if sometimes I, I may go in one direction or the other. So just my uh, disclosures. Um, so the learning objectives really here are to um, focus on advances in radiation uh, therapy that have uh, improved treatment. I'm going to discuss uh, some, uh, some, some, with some case examples. And we're also going to review uh, the literature on brain, on brain metastases. In general, brain metastases are very common, uh, 10 times more common than primary brain tumors. In patients with advanced metastatic cancer, up to 40% of patients will develop brain metastases. The most common primary uh, tumors that lead to brain metastases are lung cancer, breast cancer, uh, and melanoma. Uh, the numbers are increasing. Uh, this is probably related to the fact that we are getting better at detecting uh, brain metastases, and this is associated with technology such as MRI, which has been around for several decades now, uh, and a continued improvement in systemic therapy. Here we mean chemotherapy and targeted therapy, immunotherapy, which is allowing patients with metastatic cancer to live longer. And uh, kind of counterintuitively, as patients live longer, they develop different patterns of, of uh, spread, uh, including a more, more time to develop things like brain metastases. The historic uh, management, uh, and you guys had the, uh, I guess saw, saw my picture on, on some of those email blasts. I, I don't have that many uh, white hairs. I'm kind of losing some of my hair, but not as much white hair. But when I was a trainee, this was, largely the way that we manage patients. And essentially it was, uh, we didn't really follow, you know, on a routine basis, looking at whether patients had metastases or not on imaging. They were just sort of picked up as patients develop symptoms. So somebody came in with headaches or, or nausea or, you know, started developing some neurologic symptom. Uh, we generally stopped their systemic therapy. We, we stopped their chemotherapy. Uh, and then the decision was whether they needed whole brain radiation or whether they were too sick or advanced along the line that they, 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 you know, they didn't even qualify for whole brain radiation. And then the final step was basically to stop all these, uh, the, the, all the other treatments and uh, really focus on best supportive care. So that was sort of the, the dogma or the way that we manage patients uh, historically. More recently, um, uh, or, or before I get into the more recent sort of picture, just to, to kind of uh, show you visually here, uh, typically what was done um, is that we would have uh, two lateral beams of radiation, and this is uh, uh, what we call a digitally reconstructed radiograph. And you can see this would be a lateral beam of a, a, a patient's skull, uh, and we were really basically focusing the radiation just to the whole brain. And this was typically done in five to 10 low doses of radiotherapy. Uh, and it was designed to be simple, straightforward, non-invasive, because you know these were patients who were sick and nearing the end of their life. And we didn't really want to uh, you know, kind of uh, put them through too much of an ordeal. But then we started having uh, better tools 
uh, to try to classify patients into different groups or classes. Uh, and perhaps the kind of most relevant and early tool that was used to try to prognosticate or try to identify how long patients lived was this uh, recursive partitioning analysis. This was based on a number of clinical trials that were done in the uh, 80s and 90s. And basically, they were looking at factors that tried to predict uh, how long a patient lived. So patients who had KPS, which is a, a performance status indica indicator, which is kind of measures how well the patient is functioning. Are they spending most of the time in bed, not moving around, or are they com almost completely normal? Um, so if patients had a poor functional status or KPS less than 70, they were in class three, and their survival was quite poor. The best patients, however, were usually the younger patients, good performance status, had no metastases outside of the brain, and had a control primary. And these patients, we would see that their survival was 7.1 months. So what, this, what these tools allow us to do is to try to identify which patients are more likely to benefit from more aggressive therapy and which patients should really be considered more for less supportive care and palliative care approaches. Uh, these have been uh, updated, uh, and uh, Sperduto has uh, been a champion uh, of this. Uh, the, the next uh, set of uh, sort of prognosticating tools was called the, the GPA, or Global Prognostic Assessment. And what we can see is that patients now in the most favorable group are even having a median survival. Their average survival is around 11 months. So uh, we're able to pick up and, and identify patients that really have an extended survival. We still, again, have patients with very poor survival, 2.6 months in the lowest GPA score. And these are patients, again, who probably should just be considered for supportive care and not get any treatment. Um, with the, uh, with the uh, sort of advent or improvement in systemic therapy and uh, biomarkers, so looking at genetic, different types of genetic subtypes of, of cancers, and now there is something called the diagnosis-specific GPA, and this is an example of lung cancer. Uh, and we can see in the most favorable group, you have patients who have uh, a molecular uh, subtype of what we call uh, ALK or EGFR positive uh, non-small cell lung cancer. And the most favorable group can have a median survival of almost four years. So these are patients that really can live quite a while. Uh, and now we have to kind of ch change and uh, reconsider the old dogma of uh, stopping all treatment, giving them whole brain radiation and sending them to palliative care because their patients are gonna live a while. We really need to think about more aggressive approaches to treating these patients. Similarly, we see improvements uh, in, in, in both the diagnosis, uh, the treatment, uh, and prognostication of uh, other tumors, melanoma, another example here, we can see the, the, the most, uh, the best prognostic group has a median survival of 13, 34 months. Breast cancer as well, this has just been published uh, a few months ago and uh, we were, we contributed to, to, to this uh, and to other, um, Sunnybrook, we contributed to this and to other uh, um, evaluations of different Breast can uh, different cancer subtypes. So here we can see 36 months for patients with breast cancer in the highest or the most favorable group. So as, as there was sort of historically an understanding that there are a subset of patients that have a better prognosis, uh, there was also a, a shift to try to give more aggressive treatment. And the first set of trials that tried to do this were surgical. So uh, patients with brain metastases, specifically a single brain metastases, uh, this study by Pacho is a randomized study that looked at surgery plus whole brain, compared it to whole brain radiotherapy alone. So in both arms, whole, whole brain radiotherapy, which was a standard of care at the time, was offered. But in the experimental group, patients had surgery beforehand. And what we see is that surgery improved survival. So patients who had surgery lived on average longer. Uh, and what we can say is that in selected patients, aggressive control of the brain metastases can help people live longer. Um, 
so one of the sort of other ways alternatively other than doing surgery and this is sort of the focus of this talk is in a technology that radiation uh, oncologists and uh, neurosurgeons who do radio surgery it's called stereotactic radio surgery and what stereotactic radio surgery is is a very precise and accurate delivery of radiation, very focused, uh, high dose, precise delivery of radiation in three dimensions, usually delivered in a single fraction. And because of the fact that it's delivered with high dose and high accuracy, it has to be to a relatively small volume. Uh, and the advantage really here is that we are able to very precisely deliver radiation to this a high dose of radiation to this volume, and that volume should be corresponding to just the tumor. What it allows us to do is to spare the adjacent normal brain tissue. By doing that, we improve the control rate, so the probability that we are going to kill the cancer, and we reduce some of the side effects that are associated with treatment. So this is, the, this is sort of the foundation behind stereotactic radiosurgery. This is not comprehensive, but this is kind of the most common machines that you'll read about that are used to deliver radio surgery. Uh, the gamma knife, which is a machine on the left here, this is the one that we have here at Sunnybrook. Um, the vast majority of centers will use this setup. They'll use the workhorse of radiotherapy, which is called the linear accelerator. And then they'll have some type of uh, extra uh, uh, um, uh, accessories that are added to the uh, to the linear accelerator or the linear accelerator be designed in such a way that it is capable of delivering this very precise focused uh, accurate uh, high dose radiation treatment and then you've got another technology called cyber knife which is a robotic uh, robotic arm that is able to deliver little beamlets focused again very precisely to the target and sparing the normal tissue. So to compare, this is really the difference that we see. Uh, we see a beam, this is a, uh, a transverse slice or kind of an axial slice of the brain. This is another axial slice uh, of the brain. This is an MRI, this is CT. You can see the eyes kind of here, the nose anteriorly on both. And what you see with whole brain fields is the whole brain, not surprisingly, is basically getting the full dose of radiation treatment over a few courses. Whereas comparatively, if you look at radio surgery, here's the target and very sharply the radiation treatment is focused in that area and the rest of the brain is relatively spared of, of radiation. So, one of the uh, most significant trials to look at radio surgery was uh, the RTOG, a radiotherapy oncology group. And there was a study that was published in 2004. The first author was Andrews et al. Uh, and it was over 300 patients and was designed for one to three brain metastases. And what this study found was that the control rate, so if you look at and you follow these patients and you see uh, which patients were, will the tumor come back in and which ones will it be controlled, what we saw is that the patients who had radio surgery, so the two arms were whole brain radiotherapy in both, in both arms, and radio surgery plus whole brain was the experimental arm. So the experimental arm, the arm that had radio surgery, had a higher probability of control. Uh, which is not surprising because you're giving more radiation to that area. But what was interesting was that in the subset of patients who had a single brain metastases, the median survival, the average, sort of the average survival, was longer in patients who received radiosurgery. Now, it was a big difference, but Certainly, uh, you know, very interesting that one treatment to one spot in the body, and these are patients who have metastatic disease, that, uh, that, that, um, uh, that, so these are patients that have metastatic disease, so um, just treating one spot improved survival, and this is treatment over one day, improved survival by about a month and a half. So a good trade-off, one day of treatment, and you get about a month and a half 
uh, extra survival. Now, this is for the whole group. There may be subsets of patients where there's a significantly longer survival as well. Um, the next question that was sort of asked uh, was to see whether whole brain radiotherapy was needed at all. The standard all along was whole brain radiotherapy and let's see if surgery improves. Oh, surgery seems to improve things when we give when we when we remove a single brain metastasis. Uh, what about radiosurgery? Oh, radiosurgery seems to improve things. The question started getting asked, what about removing a whole brain radiotherapy? And what we found in those trials, which I'm not highlighting here, but very briefly, is that that whole brain radiotherapy improved the control rate of distant brain tumors. So it reduced the risk that tumors elsewhere in the, in the brain would come back and improved even the, the control rate at the site that, that we were giving radiosurgery. But the question was, well, how does whole brain radiotherapy actually affect the brain? We know that it positively influences the brain in the sense that it reduces the risk of the cancer coming back, but it does have some negative effects on the brain itself. Nobody wants their brain radiated if we don't have to radiate. So this study, Eric Chang, from, uh, when he was at the MD Anderson, uh, um, looked at using a validated neurocognitive tool called the Hopkins Verbal Learning Test. And this is a, a complex uh, um, tool that is, is a neuropsychiatric tool that evaluates uh, um, memory, short-term memory and things of that sort. So what was found was that patients who received whole brain radiotherapy, in fact, had more of a deterioration in total and delayed recall, okay? And we can see these differences as early as four months. So whole brain radiotherapy has some adverse effects on the brain and particularly related to neurocognition. Uh, a, another trial that was done, and this was uh, the first author is, uh, is a radiation oncologist at Princess Margaret, Alex Sun. This was a trial that was actually intended in patients who had non-small cell lung cancer. And, and interestingly, this was a group that didn't have clinically any evidence of brain metastases, but we were giving brain, uh, whole brain radiation, and we call it as a prophylactic cranial radiation, because they might have a high rate of microscopic disease. But we don't really have to focus on that part. Really, the, the, what I'm trying to highlight here is that this is a group that didn't have brain metastases per se, but what we can see is that, that there was a negative effect on neurocognition with whole brain radiotherapy. Okay. Um, the, the, the next uh, thing that I want to show is uh, a more recent uh, study by Paul Brown et al., which validated some of the findings that we saw in this smaller study by uh, Eric Chang. And what it shows is that, again, uh, that neurocognition is affected by whole brain radiotherapy. And we can see that impairment uh, in this study as early as three months. Okay, and here's some of the data that supports that. Um, finally, uh, uh, what we also see is that there is really no difference in survival. So whether you give whole brain radiotherapy or not, there is no difference. These are survival curves or you see no difference in how long people live in these clinical trials. So the conclusion, uh, and this has now been kind of uh, uh, adopted cross board, is that for patients who have uh, limited numbers of brain metastases, in this trial was one to three brain metastases, SRS alone is appropriate for patients and we should probably forego whole brain radiotherapy because it has no impact on survival and it affects the thinking and affects uh, neurocognition in patients. What about quality of life? Quality of life is a little bit more tangible for the average person to think about. It's things like fatigue, uh, concentration, and there's a, a number of different tools that are used. The RTC is a European tool that looks at uh, quality of life. And what we can see is that in trials that have used uh, whole brain versus no whole brain, we see a, a, a detriment uh, in terms of some of the quality of life metrics compared to uh, patients 
who have not had whole brain. So whole brain not only impacts neurocognition, but acutely has some impacts on quality of life. And I'm not going to go into too much detail about that. Other methods that have been proposed are, uh, why don't we use a neuroprotectant? So there's a drug called memantine that has been used in clinical trials, and there is some evidence to suggest that it does uh, uh, improve uh, neurocogn neurocognition, or at least it prevents some of the uh, neurocognitive decline that we see with whole brain therapy. And an interesting um, method of delivering whole brain radiotherapy is the so-called hippocampal sparing radiotherapy. So the hippocampal, hippocampus is a structure in the brain, it's a paired structure in the brain that uh, may be responsible for some of the um, uh, side effects that we see with whole brain radiotherapy. There's a neuroprogenital stem cells there and they may be impacted with relatively low doses of radiotherapy. So the idea is, can we deliver radiation to the whole brain, sparing this critical structure? And that has been tried, and there is some evidence that hippocampal sparing radiotherapy improves neurocognition or relative to whole brain radiotherapy. But really, the best way to protect the normal brain is to avoid using radiation on the normal brain. Uh, but there are some limits. Uh, the dogma suggests that greater than four brain metastases is too advanced for radiosurgery, and these patients should receive whole, whole brain radiotherapy. So here's a trial from, uh, there's a prospective uh, registry study, observational study from, from Japan that looked at patients who had multiple brain metastases, some of them up to 10 brain metastases. And what they found was that the survival of patients two to four versus five to 10 brain metastases was the same. Single brain metastases was a unique group, but patients who had two to four versus five to 10 brain metastases were very similar. So challenging this idea that two to four is much different than five to 10 in terms of number of brain metastases. But one of the arguments that people use is that, well, you know, if you've got lots of brain metastases, you know, four or five brain metastases, well, it's, it's pretty much inevitable that they're, they're going to get further brain metastases down the road and you're going to need to do whole brain radiotherapy. So let's just do it up front. There's no point kind of doing radiosurgery, watching, and then seeing them come back. But interestingly, from, the, from, this, from this study uh, by Yamamoto, what we see is that, uh, in fact, there's a, still a significant proportion of patients um, this, is, this, is a, this is the percentage here of patients who do develop new brain metastasis elsewhere in the brain, but if you take the one minus or the 100% minus this, you'll see that almost 40% of patients at one year, even if they have up to 10 brain metastases, will not develop new brain metastasis. So you are you know, potentially sparing a significant proportion of patients who don't from, from the toxicity of whole brain radiotherapy. This is a very recent, uh, just put the slide in yesterday because the abstract uh, just came out uh, uh, in, uh, in Astro. And this is uh, the results of a randomized uh, trial of 72 patients with a median follow-up of 6.6 .6 months. And interestingly, they went up to 15 metastases. And interesting what we see, uh, and actually, I mean, not surprising because this is the trend that we've been seeing all the way through is that uh, whole brain radiotherapy higher risk of neurocognitive deterioration. So they, they are suggesting that these provide level one evidence, the highest level of evidence to support SRS in patients up to 15 brain metastases. So what is the goals of brain metastases management? Well, really it's to maximize control, reduce treatment toxicity. And this last point, which we'll talk a little bit more about is decrease, decrease the invasiveness to patients. We really don't want to make this too difficult an ordeal because this is still primarily a palliative treatment. So there is emerging evidence that metastasis counting is irrelevant. The key is that as long as it's amenable to uh, SRS, you should really be thinking about doing it. This is a uh, radio surgery. Um, there is prospective data that suggests that, again, I'm showing the Japanese uh, data, four to 10 of brain metastases and we see with the uh, current RCT that was, was just published in abstract form, 
that uh, up to 15 brain metastases. And we are doing our own clinical trial at uh, Sunnybrook. It is now open, uh, where we are comparing SRSs in both arms, and we're comparing to see the impact of whole brain radiotherapy, up to 20 brain metastases. Now let's talk a little bit about how radiosurgery historically was done and where it's moving to. So it, 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 what it was typically, and it, there's still a number of patients that are still done this way for a variety of different reasons I don't have time to really get into, but essentially it involves this, this frame that basically is screwed in or bolted in through, pierces through the skin and just uh, um, is fixed to the skull table. It requires usually a CT scan for simulation. Patients can wait hours by the time that all of the CT information, MRI, the positioning, the contouring of the target, the uh, planning, and then subsequently the patient has treatment. So the patient can be there for hours. This frame is uncomfortable. It can be, you know, kind of a whole day ordeal that's quite uncomfortable. Um, as I stated, the, this required invasive frame can be quite uncomfortable. And then the, the other challenge that we have is that if you are treating multiple, multiple targets, sometimes this can be hours and hours of treatment, uh, and it can actually be a, a limitation in the ability to deliver uh, radiosurgery to, to many targets because of the fact that you have to keep patients on the treatment machine for hours if they have you know, 20 lesions. So this is where, um, you know, this is just that one example. There are, are a number of different systems that are that are used to deliver uh, uh, radio surgery in a relatively non-invasive fashion. But this is the one we use. It's called the Icon system. It's the kind of the most recent version of the gamma knife. And what it involves is a thermoplastic mask. So this is a patient that's lying down on this bed here, and there's a bunch of uh, <clears throat> Posts. There's two posts with a bunch of sort of markers, and there's this tag on the nose. And there's an optical tracking system that basically tracks the movement of the markers uh, relative to these fixed posts. And it's thresholded, and if you move uh, beyond a certain amount, uh, the treatment stops. So this way, what we're able to do is use a non-invasive uh, approach that's more comfortable uh, with a thermoplastic mask, and um, but you're, you 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 don't have the the uh, the ability to completely immobilize a patient that you would have with a frame with the invasive frame, but by by tracking them uh, with the optical tracking system, you are able to ensure that the precision and accuracy of delivery is very good. There are other uh, immobilization systems. So I showed this is the icon. Uh, there is a bite block systems, and then there is kind of regular, more rigid uh, thermoplastic systems that are also available on the market. So what are the advantages of a Gamma Knife Icon? And again, similar uh, system is that it's more comfortable. Uh, it can also deliver treatment over multiple, multiple days. So instead of treatment, as we, as we talked about, if you have 20 lesions and each lesion takes, you know, 15 minutes to treat, you can be you can be in the machine for hours here what we are capable of doing is because the the, the thermoplastic mask is removable we can we can uh, have the patient treated for a few lesions every day <coughs> excuse me over a couple of days and that way uh you know it's much more comfortable and more realistic and more easy to treat multiple targets for 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 patients the other advantage uh which is emerging uh, in the literature and, you know, people are building up more and more experience is that for large brain metastases, typically one dose of radiation was felt to be uh, too much of a, a risk to, to, the, to, to the patient in terms of swelling and side effects that may, de may develop with giving a single large dose of radiation. So uh, one of the potential advantages of, 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 of a uh, non-invasive system like the Gamma Knife Icon is that you can divide the radiation per target over a number of days. Uh, so we give anywhere between three to five uh, fractions or doses of radiation for the same target. So split, instead of giving it all in one shot, you can split it over a few days. And by doing that, it gives a chance for the normal brain to recover uh, and you don't develop as much swelling and side effects associated 
with, uh, with radiosurgery. Uh, so we'll go, go to a case. This is a, this is a patient with lung cancer, a young patient with lung cancer. Uh, initially had, unfortunately, multiple brain metastases. Uh, appropriately offered whole brain radiotherapy, but this patient, you know, sought out uh, multiple opinions. And again, for select patients, and I wouldn't, I, I would caution against this being used as a general recommendation across patients, but in select patients, and this patient in particular, you know, very good performance status, younger patient, uh, and has a particular type of mutation in their lung cancer that would render them a long-term survivor, likely a long-term survivor. So this is the type of patient that we said, look, we have another option for you, which is to deliver radiosurgery alone. Okay. And that's what we did. And we gave this treat, uh, there was 34 targets that we treated. We divided over five days. So on average, about seven lesions a day, almost an hour every day of treatment. Patient tolerated very nicely. We can see that the cumulative dose to the whole brain was quite low, only less than two gray, which is less than one fraction of uh, a 10 fraction radiation course for the whole brain. And uh, what we saw is that on subsequent imaging, uh, patient responded very nicely. These lesions all shrunk. Of course, I'm only going to choose the nice examples for you guys, uh, but uh, it went very well uh, and uh, has been followed uh, for now for a couple of years with uh, no uh, new metastases. So where do we go from here? As I said, you know, our, our goals are really to improve cancer control, improve the patient experience. Um, we do have, as I said, this clinical trial at uh, Sunnybrook where we're doing now five to 20 brain metastases. Our primary objective is to look at neurocognition because we know in other, other trials that really this is, the, this is the kind of most important metric that we should be looking at, but other metrics such as tumor control, quality of life, and survival are also uh, will be evaluated. Um, so how to reduce invasiveness? Well, uh, one known complication, unfortunately, and this is, this is a, well, probably the biggest challenge of radiosurgery is something called radiation necrosis. We are at this delicate balance between trying to give as much dose of radiation to the target in the brain. Uh, by doing that, however, we end up being pretty close to the tolerance of the normal brain. Uh, if we aren't, then we're, we're not being aggressive enough with our treatment to the, to the tumor and perhaps allowing the tumor a higher probability for occurring. If we are being too aggressive, well then our toxicity is, we may be improving control, but our toxicity is too high. And then, our, and this would be radiation uh, necrosis. That's the primary toxicity that we see with, with radiosurgery. Uh, one of the challenges is that it's very difficult to differentiate it with regular growth of tumor. On a regular MRI, they look very similar. Uh, which makes it quite challenging to differentiate radiation necrosis from progressing tumor. Surgery may be a way, so actually getting a piece of that lesion that we think is either necrosis or tumor may be a way to do it, but that's invasive. You know, brain surgery is uh, sometimes sometimes straightforward, but in many cases not not uh, not a walk in the park, as they say. So we need a better way to understand response to treatment and to differentiate between necrosis and progression. This is something that we've been working on. I'm going to give you an example. This is a not a not a particularly nice story, but I'll, you'll kind of see the highlight the some of the difficulties that we have. This is a 71 year old with colon cancer, found to have three brain metastases, including one that was in the brainstem. Okay, so this is in the in the in the brain in a part of the brainstem called the pons. Uh, it's a critical area, uh, and um, you know, relatively large tumor sitting in the pods. So this patient received stereotactic radiosurgery to this area. And then we followed up and unfortunately, uh, not much change. Uh, patient was still asymptomatic, but you can kind of, I see it looks maybe a little bit more dense, there's a little bit more swelling in the area. And we're not really sure what's going on here. Is this tumor shrinking, uh, responding to treatment? It's not really by size criteria. It's still maybe a little bit larger. Is this just radiation effect or radiation necrosis? We don't know. 
And unfortunately, you know, lesions in the brainstem are not something that you can put a needle in and, and biopsy uh, easily without, you know, significant impairment. So there were attempts at trying to uh, identify, and this is some of the advanced imaging, like PET scan, and then there's a, a MRI sequence, called a perfusion sequences. We look at how the blood supply is in this area, the metabolism. And this patient was started on steroids. Began to develop symptoms related to this enlarging lesion in the brain. Did not tolerate steroids and unfortunately got clinically worse. Uh, we tried to get them into this clinical trial for medical therapy for radiation necrosis. Unfortunately, the patient presented back to the clinic very unwell and passed away shortly afterwards. So the question is, uh, you know, as we, as we followed through, what we saw is that there's progression here uh, on the scan. And, and, and this, was, this, this patient was no longer able to really even get any therapy. And that's why we sent the palliative care and shortly passed away afterwards. One of the methods that we are working on, and this is, there's a number of different uh, 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 scientific approaches to kind of uh, try to uh, help us with this question about how to differentiate tumor from radiation necrosis. But our approach has been to use a uh, non-contrast based uh, MRI sequence called CEST or chemical, ex uh, chemical exchange saturation transfer. We've published on this and what we have shown is that certain CEST parameters are able to pick up low levels of metabolites that help us identify that this is an active area of tumor versus, for example, uh, necrotic uh, tissue. Uh, and we are now currently uh, doing this on a much larger um, uh, cohort of patients and honestly very encouraging results uh, that we hope to publish soon. And, uh, and uh, we have a lot of optimism that this may be a tool that is used to help differentiate early on uh, tumors from radiation necrosis and allow us to proceed uh, appropriately with medical therapy or surgery if, if possible. So in, in summary, advances in technology allows for more personalized management of intracranial metastases. Understanding the biology of tumors before, during, and after treatment still remains a focus of study. Improvements in, a, in imaging and radiation continue to provide gains uh, for this patient population. This is our radiation team. Lots of uh, uh, folks are involved in ensuring that we are delivering the highest uh, quality of uh, radio surgery. Thank you, that is it. I'm open to questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Solomon. Uh, once again, you've, you've taken a very uh, tough topic and have explained it in different ways for us to understand. So we really appreciate that. A couple of questions that did come through. Uh, one is, are radiation-induced hypocampal side effects typically observed acutely or only cover, uh, or only over time? So uh, the side effects, uh, so we're talking about whole brain radiation? Um, just or radiation? Says, it says, are radiation-induced hypocampal side effects typically observed acutely or only over time? Okay, Maybe. Very good question. Okay. Yeah. So. So I, primarily, that's a whole brain toxicity. Okay. Uh, although um, you know you can see, you know, presumably you can give enough. If there's enough metastases near the hippocampus, you can also be giving a fair, a significant dose of, of uh, radiation to the hippocampus. No, these are these are unfortunately permanent side effects, that have been picked up as early as three months. Uh, some of the challenges that we have anytime we do a palliative trial a trial with palliative patients unfortunately what happens is that the patients die and they get sicker with time so the data further and further out from when they were on the clinical trial becomes less and less uh reliable right okay so we don't have as good data i apologize just my phone in the background there okay uh, uh, the 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 data with uh, as we get further and further along uh, or from the from the treatment, the 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 results of, of clinical trials in terms of the numbers that we see are less reliable. But we see as early as three months, four months, six months, we see these changes, and these are permanent changes uh, in the brain. 
Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, the next uh, question other side is, yeah, go ahead. is SRS recommended for primary tumors or only metas metas metastatic secondary brain tumors? Uh, excellent question, and it depends on the tumor. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the challenge that we see with many primary brain tumors, uh, sorry, just give me one quick second. No problem. I uh, apologize for that. Um, the, 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 um, with regards to uh, SRS for primary brain tumors, the, the challenge with primary brain tumors, particularly brain tumors such as um, uh, gliomas, is that they're infiltrative. They have basically roots in the brain. Mm -hmm. And radiosurgery, stereotyped radiosurgery is a very focused radiation treatment that's really designed to just treat a very sharply kind of focused area and you know, adjacent to it, we're really trying to uh, minimize the dose of radiation to that area. That is kind of counter to how we would normally want to treat uh, some of these tumors that are more infiltrative, like gliomas. Right. So gliomas have roots in the brain. They're admixed with normal brain tissue. So a technology like stereotactic radiosurgery is not as useful. It's been tried uh, even for just boosting, like giving a part of the tumor and has not really been shown to be successful. Other tumors, though, some of, more, some of the benign tumors are very well demarcated, like meningiomas, pituitary adenomas. These tumors are very well defined in the brain. Uh, these are the types of tumors, primary brain tumors, that uh, radiosurgery is used. Mm -hmm. It's so, actually interesting that you mentioned that because somebody online here with us today, one of our caregivers, it was just a, a comment, not a question, but she said that she found your uh, presentation very interesting and in that her husband had a primary non-malignant tumor and he had one yeah. uh, session of SRS after surgery. Exactly. So the rules apply uh, and, and, you know, the, the, the technology is transferable, not even just tumors, by the way. We, even some neurological conditions can be treated with gamma knife radio surgery. So mm -hmm. certain types of uh, conditions like trigeminal neuralgia, which is kind of a pain syndrome associated with the, with the fifth cranial nerve, um, even certain uh, tremors. Uh, some, th these things can be treated by very focusing to a particular part of the brain, uh, you know, high dose radiation causing a lesion that can, can, can impact it. But the principle behind stereotactic radiosurgery, radiosurgery is really providing very precise delivery of radiation. Mm -hmm. which is useful in benign tumors, which are not infiltrative, don't have roots in the brain. Not as useful, unfortunately, in some of these, uh, in, in some primary brain tumors like gliomas that are more infiltrative that have roots uh, in, in the brain. Sure thing. Thank you so much. Um, there was one other question that came up and it was, um, is it common to develop brain cysts after radiation treatments? Uh, very good question. That is a late, late, side effect that we sometimes see with stereotactic radiosurgery. Um, with brain metastasis, we don't unfortunately, well, fortunately or unfortunately, we don't see that too often because of the fact that, you know, unfortunately patients don't generally live that long to develop that kind of a degenerative uh, cystic formation. But we do see it in, uh, in, in some lesions, for example, uh, we call them AVMs, or arteriovenous malformations, where patients can live long, long time, and these are patients that are following. Sometimes they can develop these cystic formation after uh, stereotactic radiosurgery. So that is that is a long-term side effect. Not as not not commented as much because unfortunately with brain metastasis, we just don't see it uh, as a function of the fact that patients don't live that long. Okay, thank you. A couple more comments and questions came in. Uh, one was if you could comment regarding tumor voluming and decision making. Excellent question. So. And, maybe uh, what, and what does that mean for the best, those of us who aren't healthcare professionals? Yeah. So I, I kind of alluded a little bit to it, but um, the, the radio surgery is uh, generally, um, you know, because we're delivering very high doses of radiotherapy in a, in a well-defined area, the larger the tumor is or the larger the lesion is, there is still going to be some splash of intermediate low, low dose radiotherapy around the target. So for very large targets, uh, and that large, what the, what the cutoff is, is a little bit, um, 
let's say there's a bit of a moving target, but traditionally was around three, in some studies, up to four centimeters. So if a tumor was larger than three or four centimeters, would not be considered for radiosurgery. Okay? And the idea is that the larger you are, the larger the tumor is, the more surrounding normal brain tissue is going to receive uh, radiotherapy, even, and the tumor itself may respond with swelling, and the more likely that you can de develop side effects acutely as well as long-term. So that's where we are experimenting with fractionation, dividing the radiation dose instead of one, one big shot, dividing it into uh, uh, multiple shots of radiation. Our approach at Sunnybrook uh, is that tumors less than two centimeters, we would generally give with a single fraction of radiotherapy. Okay, there are some exceptions to that, uh, with, with single fraction of radiosurgery. Once you start getting above two centimeters, we start dividing it to over three to five fractions. The largest tumors we treat are usually around five, six, centi five, six centimeters. Once you get larger than that, you know, uh, then you should really be very cautious about proceeding with, with, uh, with, with a with stereotactic approach. Usually those are patients who need surgery because they've got such a large tumor that's causing lots of mass effect and so forth. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, somebody else asked, has the CEST method only been looked at in brain, meta brain mets or has it been looked at in gliomas as well? And then another note she added was after radiation therapy, not specifically SRS. Uh, sorry, just the, you cut off in the end there. Oh, what sorry. Is... So it's the question is, has the CST method only been looked at in brain mets or has it been looked at in gliomas as well? And then she added after radiation therapy, not specifically SRS. Okay, yeah. Uh, excellent question. And the answer is yes. Uh, we are actually also evaluating this uh, imaging modality for uh, for gliomas. We published on it. Uh, and it is, uh, we're not using so much for necrosis in those tumors, but more as a response assessment, which patients are more likely to, as an early sort of uh, imaging biomarker of response. So which, which, which tumors have responded uh, early uh, as opposed to kind of the standard anatomical uh, ways of, of evaluating response. One of the challenges with, with tumors like glioblastomas, for example, is that after you radiate them, you and this is with, with fractionated radiation, regular radiotherapy, not radiosurgery, uh, and you follow them, they don't generally shrink that much. And um, so you don't really have a good handle on whether this patient is responding or, you know, are, are we going to be in trouble in a couple of months? So this is where looking at some of the functional, uh, not just anatomical changes by size and volume, but looking at what's happening at a at a more um, molecular, biological level, looking at metabolism and things of that sort. So a number of different ways of doing it. So Seth is, is a method that we are using, yes, to, to, uh, to evaluate response, and it is promising. Great, thank you. Um, somebody else asked um, if you could comment on the role of whole brain radiation after stereotactic radiation. So uh, in the kind of in the build up to the story around treatment of brain metastases, uh, there was a there was a period of time that was probably about a decade ago where the there was sort of a split and and many centers in addition to offering radio surgery were giving whole brain radiotherapy, and the reason was that whole brain radiotherapy still reduces the risk of recurrence elsewhere in the brain. Radiosurgery is a focal treatment, but it does, it, it, and it, it works very well at getting rid of the tumor where we see it, but it's not very good at getting rid of, well, it's not good at all of, of getting rid of tumors that you don't see that are at microscopic level in the brain that may develop down the road. So the idea was give radiosurgery and then do whole brain radiotherapy before or afterwards to try to get rid of that microscopic disease in the brain and that reduces the risk of recurrence in the brain. And it does, and, it, and that strategy does work. But the problem is, is that it doesn't improve survival, and there are significant side effects associated with whole brain radiotherapy. So as an upfront adjunct to stereotactic radiosurgery, we have, as a field, moved away from giving whole brain radiotherapy, unless we really have to, unless there are too many brain metastases that we can't do it, 
unless you have you know type different types of brain metastases for example if you have left meningeal disease or if you have lots of packing meningeal so different patterns of brain metastases which would be which would which would be sort of difficult to give with radiosurgery alone mm -hmm. but in the majority of cases now for, with limited number of brain metastases we try to forego whole brain radiotherapy we try not to give whole brain radiotherapy up front sometime along the disease project trajectory a year two years depending on how patients are doing how many metastases develop we may still use whole brain well, like i don't want to i don't want to give the impression that we don't use whole brain radiotherapy unfortunately we give it a lot but what we're trying to do is up front particularly in patients with limited brain metastases, trying to avoid giving it because mm -hmm. it has some impact, has some effects on the brain. But we are unfortunately forced to do it sometimes down the road. Okay, great. Thank you so much for that. Uh, that's it for our questions that have come through. So before we log off, I'm just going to switch uh, you out of presenter mode for a second, Hanny, and I'm going to switch it to me so that I can show my screen. Just give me one second. I just want to show everybody online um, some things that we have coming up. So uh, this was our, what month are we in? October. This was our 10 of 12 webinars that we hosted this year. And the next one is with Dr. Janet Ellis. She works in psychiatry at Sunnybrook as well. And she's also one of our research grant recipients for Brain Tumor Foundation. And she's going to be presenting on November 25th on Dignity Therapy. Um, which is a therapeutic intervention for individuals with life-limiting illness. This was the first time I had actually heard of this um, therapy, and it sounds really, really interested, interesting. So make sure you register for that. And then we have our very own Todd Gould, who's going to be joining us on December 16th, talking about um, the holidays coming up and how to pace ourselves and uh, knowing what our limitations are during the holiday season. So that can be found under helpful information when you go to braintumor.ca. The other thing I'd like to um, point out is this right here, Hats for Hope. We had our Hats for Hope uh, Day, uh, Brain Cancer Awareness Day was just this past Saturday on October 24th. And um, every day, 27 Canadians are diagnosed with a brain tumor and eight of those 27 Canadians are diagnosed with a um, malignant brain tumor. So you can visit our Hats for Hope uh, website and you can still purchase a toque for yourself. They're $30. Um, we do encourage people to order in bulk because there is a one-time um, delivery fee of $12. So you can pool some, some orders from friends and family or colleagues. I know that the team at Sunnybrook did that, so thank you. And uh, make sure when you get your hat, you take a picture and post it online for us. And um, the other thing, I'm just checking my list here. Uh, oh, yes, tonight is the next community call-in with both myself and um, Todd Gould again. So if you go to virtual programs here and click on that and scroll down to virtual support, this is where you're gonna find information about upcoming community call-ins, as well as all of our virtual support groups uh, that are on that we have now online. Uh, we've almost tripled the number of virtual support groups um, that we're offering now since the beginning of COVID and also our community call-in. So tonight we're gonna to be focusing on social isolation during COVID and you can register for that. I did include that link in the chat for everybody earlier in the presentation, but I can also uh, email it out to, every, to everybody if anybody else is interested. And I'm just double checking the question section, Dr. Solomon. Um, okay, perfect. I think that's it. So thank you so much for joining us today, uh, Dr. Solomon. We really, really appreciate your time and energy around this. And um, uh, as I mentioned earlier on, everybody, this webinar has been recorded and we will uh, let you know via email when it is uploaded uh, to our website, usually within a week or, or so the latest. So thanks again. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.